at the Software Design is a podcast about designing software. Together with my guest, we are talking about the architecture, implementation details, and related challenges. If you are interested in the software development, this podcast is for you. Feel free to join us. Sometimes unexpected things may happen. And today, this is not an exception. A few weeks ago, I asked my colleague, Sebastian, who will be the podcast co-host today, if he can help me to organize interview with our today guest. And he agreed, and after a couple of days, we had everything prepared and scheduled. And to be honest, I've been waiting for this, for this specific moment, for, for a long time. So this is a huge honor for me to introduce a special, a special better software design guest, author of very important books about the clean code, about the programming principles, one of the originators of Agile Manifesto, Robert C. Martin, also well known as Uncle Bob. Hello, Bob. Hello, Sebastian. It's nice to hear both of you. <laughs> It's good, good to be here. <laughs> good to be as well. I'm really happy to co-host this event too. So... Bob, I have the first question for you. Every developer knows who Uncle Bob is, who you are, but how did you become Uncle Bob? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is probably the first and the last question in this interview. <laughs> the story is an old one. It goes back to uh, 1988. Uh, I was working at a startup company that was doing... a uh, telecommunications testing. And there was a young programmer there. His name was Billy. And Billy gave everybody a nickname. I was Uncle Bob. And he, he would walk around saying, Uncle Bob, Uncle Bob, what about this? Uncle Bob, what about that? And it really kind of drove me nuts. I didn't like it at all. Uh, I eventually left that company. And then no one was calling me Uncle Bob. And I realized that I missed it. And so I put it in my email signature, uh, and that was a mistake because it caught on very rapidly. I wound up at a conference um, several years later, and people were hollering down the aisles, Uncle Bob, come over here. So I, I realized that I had kind of created a monster. And then over time, I thought, well, this is probably a good brand. So I've kept it as a brand name, and I think it does work pretty well. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's perfect because you know, the, the, as Sebastian mentioned, everyone knows who who the Uncle Bob is. So, so even if you didn't add the last name, you know who the Uncle Bob is. So, so. I, I was curious, what, what is the story behind it? Speaking about the story, you are one of the originators of Agile Manifesto. Years ago, in Snowbird Utah, you thought you 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 met a lot of interesting people, and you create something which changed the the industry. So, what is the story? behind the Agile Manifesto and how it's even possible that so many great people, including you, including uh, uh, Martin Fowler, met each other in Snowbeat 19 years ago and proposed a short document, few sentences, which changed the IT industry so much. So, so what is the story behind the Agile Manifesto? Well, it depends on how long you have, because this story could be very long or very, very short. I'll try to give you the medium version of the story. Um, for years, we had been uh, convinced that the best way to write software was to do it in phases, right? the, the analysis phase, the design phase, and the implementation phase, the so-called waterfall process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that had begun in the 1970s. And, and for almost 30 years, it was the way. And nobody had a better answer. And then all of a sudden, somebody did. Um, Kent Beck started writing about extreme programming. Ken Schwaber started writing about Scrum. Alistair Coburn started writing about small little processes. Jim Copeland started writing about uh, little processes. And there was a, a sudden flurry of that kind of thinking. The, the loudest of them was Kent Beck. He wrote books on the notion of extreme programming. And so um, at one point, Martin Fowler and I got together 
and and thought that it would be a good idea to get everybody who was talking about these ideas together in a place and see if there were commonalities, see if there was a unified message that we could send to the industry at large. So Mar Martin and I met at a coffee shop in Chicago and we cobbled together an email and sent it out to a bunch of people. And the name of the, the subject line of that email was the Lightweight Process Summit. And one of the people we invited was Alistair Coburn, who called me almost instantly on the phone and said, uh, I was just about to send out the same email, uh, but um, I like your invitation better than my invitation list. So can I add my invitation list to yours and invite my people? And in return, I will do all the legwork if you will have the meeting here in Snowbird. And of course, you know, when someone volunteers to do something, you say yes. So um, and Alistair was a good guy anyway. And so we uh, we decided to have the whole thing at Snowbird then. And here you go. You, you got a, a 17 people uh, and they're um, they're all gathered together. And, and these are software consultants, right? Very. Um, I don't want to use the word arrogant, but that's close. <laughs> we, we all have very high opinions of ourselves and we're all very opinionated. And uh, uh, for some reason or another, these 17 people who would otherwise disagree on just about everything um, sat down and came up with the Agile Manifesto. And we all looked at each other and agreed. Now, now I've been to these kinds of meetings many times before, and usually what happens is nothing. <laughs> you, know, you, you come up with some kind of statement or something and everybody goes home and that's the end. And that's just not what happened here. Uh, we made a statement at the end and the world kind of went nuts. And that's kind of the story. That, that's just the way it all happened. Did, did you have a told, a single told that this is a document which will be responsible for changing the IT industry at this moment? Well, I think we all had a hope, but the hope is... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I said, we, we, we've done these kinds of things many times before. If you're a software consultant, you engage in these kinds of things all the time. And so usually you think, well, you know, maybe a few people will listen. Most people won't. Uh, and that's not what happened. We, we raised uh, an awful lot of awareness with this. So it's, it was a, a one-time miracle. I don't expect that it'll happen much again. <laughs> <laughs> The idea was amazing about Agile Manifesto, but what do you think about uh, our implementation? What industry done to uh, Agile Manifesto right now? Did we succeed or maybe we failed? What do you feel about now? Well, there is no one story there. There are people who are doing very well using, using Agile techniques. Uh, there are other people who are not doing very well using Agile techniques. Um, and... That's because they interpret those techniques in different ways. Now, we, we want people to interpret them in different ways, but if you interpret them against the manifesto, if you interpret them against the, the uh, ideal, then you're probably not going to have good results. So a lot of people, for example, attempt to continue doing waterfall and call it agile. Oh, that's probably not going to work very well. Other people um, will will use part of Agile, but they will ignore the engineering principles behind it. They will ignore things like test-driven development and refactoring and, and clean code and so on. And um, they're not going to have a good result. So we see a, a full spectrum out there. There's a lot of folks doing it very, very well. And there are a lot of folks that struggle. Well, so it all depends, right? Well, everything all in all depends. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I can say something more about that if you want. I mean, I mean, there are some very obvious uh, things that you do not want to do. If you want to follow the agile way of working, you want to focus very strongly on engineering principles, test-driven development, clean, cl clean code, pair programming, simple design, refactoring. You want to make sure that that's at the core of, of what the programmers are doing. You want to make sure that you have a very intense communication pathway between the programmers and the users and the customers. 
you don't want to have this this thing where the customers are off in an ivory tower somewhere and and once every six months they hand you a wad of requirements. That's not going to work very well. And then the other thing that probably doesn't work very well is attempting to get 500 programmers to use a single Agile process. The Agile, the Agile idea was meant for a dozen people or so, small teams, small teams doing small things. And if you want to do something large, then you need to coordinate those small teams doing small things. But you don't want to create, you know, a massive team doing one big thing. That just doesn't work anyway. <laughs> and from the perspective of the time and, the, and your personal perspective, do you think is it a time right now for the new manifesto? I, I mean, would you like to change something in the original uh, your ideas or the the principle, the the rules? Your ideas are still still unchanged. No, I think the the rules are unchanged. I wouldn't I wouldn't go back and change anything. There was a a thought about 10 years ago that we should add one line to the manifesto, uh, which was craftsmanship over crap. But uh, that wasn't really a good idea, and nobody really wanted to add that line anyway. These these documents that come out, you know, like the Agile Manifesto, are a moment in time. Uh, they are not evolving documents. They don't shift with the winds that blow. They're just a statement. And we we want to keep that statement in its original form so that people can always look back on it and realize what Agile is. Uh, just a moment ago, you said that we don't want to business to be in the ivory tower, right? So why as developers, we put so much effort to focus on the technology part of our industry, but not in the communication and interact with other people? Should we more focus on that? Should we care about business and communication more? Well, we absolutely should. I mean, programmers are technologists. We, we got into this this field because we like bits, you know, we like bytes, we like we like the deep technology. And uh, to a certain extent, we don't much care for people. <laughs> we'd, we'd, <laughs> rather, we'd rather be, you know, typing on our laptop and, and making stuff work than sitting in a meeting. Um, so that's just the way programmers are. And I don't mean to stereotype every programmer, but but generally speaking, programmers would rather be sitting at their terminal and not in a meeting. However, to do the job well, you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to talk to other people. You have to be able to empathize. You have to be able to understand the problems that other people have. It is good to know the technology. It is good to be able to wield the technology, but you have to know why you are wielding the technology and what the purpose of that technology is. I used to work for a company long ago, and the CEO of this company made it a point that every programmer had to go out in the field and spend a day with the customer. And, and in this case, the customer were, were telephone repairmen. So my turn came and I had to go to a, a, a rural state like Ohio and uh, ride along in the truck with a telephone repairman and have him tell me all his dirty jokes and stories and, and then watch him climb the pole and see what he was doing up there and listen to him talk to angry customers over, the, over his headset. And I learned a tremendous amount about the people that I was trying to solve problems for. It, it, it is a, a remarkably world-changing event when you spend a day with the customer. It's a shame that uh, more companies don't do that nowadays. Yeah, but Bob, you, you remind me of one project, uh, one project I remember where exactly the same problem happened. Uh, I mean, the developer didn't want to understand the customer and uh, the manager responsible for managing this team decided to spend all the team for one week to the telephone center where the, the, the software was operating and they had to use the software for a single week. <laughs> and after a week, 
they changed they change everything because they started <laughs> they started to listen to customers because they they felt they pains so so this is more or less almost the same story very almost similar story <laughs> yeah <laughs> take a shoes off your customer and and start to 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 talk with other people and start to understand they 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 pains and they and probably you will see the new problems, not the technology problem, maybe user interface problems more, more or less. As, as you mentioned, the mind-opening event. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely is mind-opening. And, and the, other, the other skill that programmers need is the outward communication skill. Uh, programmers need to develop the ability to speak and to write and to write convincingly uh, and to make presentations convincingly. Uh, so that so that their ideas, whether they're technological or based on customers, their ideas can be heard. A, uh, a, a programmer who cannot make a presentation to management is going to be at an extreme disadvantage when one day they have an idea and they cannot communicate that idea. Even if you are a great developer, if you do not understand business, you will not provide the best value of it. If you do not understand business, you are not a great developer. Yes, yes, exactly. Speaking about the developers, speaking about the, the, the industry itself, based on your experience, because <laughs> this is maybe something that matters. So, so what bothers you the most about the tech industry right now? Because we speak about the developers, the skills, but maybe it's, uh, there are some other aspects we, we should consider. So what bothers you the most about the tech industry? What bothers me the most about the uh, development community is that it is 70 years old, roughly. And in that 70 years, we have not developed a set of disciplines, standards, and ethics. We, we do not know who we are as a group. We, we know that we write code, but that's about all. We do not know what we stand for. We do not know what our disciplines are. We do not know what, what we ought to do and ought not to do. We profess nothing. And because we profess nothing, we cannot call ourselves professionals. <laughs> to become professionals, we must decide what our standards, ethics, and disciplines are, and we must profess them And our employers and our customers must hear that and understand it to know what it is that we profess, what it is we are willing to do, what it is we are willing to not do or not willing to do, and, and hire us on that basis. Yes, that sounds really, really great. But how we should do that? How we should make our industry to, you know, make a profession? Well, it's a good question. And it's... Um, a very difficult question. What we need to do is look back at other industries and see how they did it. You know, how did the doctors do this? There was a time uh, 200 years ago when anybody could be a doctor. There were no, uh, no requirements. You could just hang a shingle outside your door and say that you were a doctor and then, and then do surgeries. <laughs> you know, hopefully you knew something. Um, and then, The, the real people who became doctors, who studied, who really understood, decided that they could not tolerate having these other people who did not know what they were doing because they, they, they decided they were ruining the profession. So they created a profession. They created standards and ethics and disciplines. And they also created a a means to enforce it. They, they created a community that people would have to join with rules that they would have to abide by. And you could be thrown out of that community uh, if you violated those rules. We are not there yet in software. We don't have that community yet. But I could envision something like that starting. And it might start with certain companies. Uh, it might start with certain consulting agencies who, who adopt a set of, of uh, discipline standards and ethics and then advertise them to the world at large. And other companies would then hire you based on that profession, based on what you profess. Uh, and, and that might spread. 
And you might find several companies like that with different standard ethics. And there would be a competition amongst them. And the ones that succeed the most would, would be the ones that win. So I don't know how it will happen. I do know that it'll have to happen. My fear is that it will be forced upon us by governments. And the governments will decide what our standards, our ethics, and our discipline will have to be. And if government makes those decisions on our behalf, they will be wrong. <laughs> But you know, I, I've got right now some flashback in my, in my head because a few weeks ago with my friends, we had a very, very similar conversation about the, the, the principles, about the professions, about the governments, as you mentioned. And uh, the, the initial point of the discussion was that doctors are learning during the studies, during the exams, and you, you need to have some license to perform, for example, a surgery operation. And if you are, for example, a developer, you are learning a lot on production, on your customer. So, and this is a problem. This is a huge problem. For for example, if you if you imagine the, the the or if you remind the previous situations with Volkswagen engines or 787 Max aircrafts, the, the, a lot of problems caused by the developers and the processes or misprocesses around it. Uh, you once said that uh, every five years we double amount of developers, right? So maybe there is a problem. Uh, there is a reason why we cannot have this profession because there is too much people to just engage in our community, to, to be, being a developer. And we, we need to stop down, calm down and make this happen to just being more professional. So uh, the number of programmers in the world is enormous and the demand continues to grow. And so, yes, we, we're hiring young people at a ferocious rate. And the, um, the, the rate of doubling is something on the order of every five years, which, which means that half the programmers in the world have less than five years experience. And that's a problem. It's very difficult to make a profession when the vast majority of the members of that profession are too young to even conceive of a profession. <laughs> <laughs> they just got out of school. <laughs> the school did not teach them disciplines and, and standards and ethics. All the school taught them was for loops and if statements uh, and uh, bad procedures for getting projects done. And then they wind up inside of an industry that does not realize that it's not dealing with a profession. If you were to ask managers, if you were to go to CEOs or CTOs even and ask them if they're programmers were professional, they would look at you and say, well, of course they are. We don't hire non-professionals. And little do they know that the, the vast majority of people they are hiring have no idea what a profession is, <laughs> that, that cannot, cannot have a profession because they, they profess nothing. This is a, a, a big problem that we have in our industry, and it will remain uh, as long as the demand remains as high it is, as it currently is. There's no way to there's no way to avoid the fact that the vast majority of programmers are going to be in their 20s for um, the foreseeable future. So maybe the average experience of every single developer in the community is the is the reason why we make the same mistakes over and over because there is there is no no, no time to learn. <laughs> so <laughs> so from, from your perspective, how many times? You notice that the, as an industry, we reinvented the same thing over and over. Or maybe we just create a new name for something someone invented years ago. Oh, that happens all the time. And it happens over and over and over again. There's Right now, we've currently got a whole spate of brand new languages. <laughs> we've got Swift and Dart and Go and Elm and... And just a whole bunch of brand new languages. And none of them are actually new. They're all just um, language features that we've seen before in, in different groupings and different formats. But there's no real new idea in any of them. They're all roughly the same kind of languages before. Maybe they're a little bit stronger typed or a little bit weaker typed. Or they've got, you know, a little more inheritance or a little less inheritance or, you know, whatever it is that... They're just little tiny tweaks on very old ideas. 
And the same thing happens with frameworks. All of a sudden, there's a new framework and everybody's got to be using the new framework. But it's not a new framework at all. It's just an old idea from 30 years before that that's now being recast in a slightly different different way. Um, our industry lives on churn, lives on turmoil, lives on constant change, even when the change is meaningless change. We love the, the, the constant turnover of, of new things, even though there are new, no new ideas in the new things. And that's just a symptom of um, youth, impetuous youth. At some point, we're going to have to settle that down and make some choices uh, and realize that we don't need 74 new languages and we don't need 28 new frameworks. The old, the ones we've got are just fine. We've been through a period where the, uh, the hardware was going through revolution after revolution after revolution. And you may remember this, right? There was a time not too long ago that the clock rates of a computer doubled every 18 months. Mm -hmm, uh, and mm -hmm. you, you could not have a computer. If you bought a computer, you couldn't, you couldn't own it for more than a year and a half because by the time a year and a half went by, it would be so out of date and so slow and, and so useless that it couldn't run any of the new software. So you had to buy a new machine every 18 months. That stopped. Uh, it stopped at, a, at a, a level which is enormous. I mean, we have clock rates that are stupidly fast, 2.8 gigahertz usually. And, you know, we have four computers or eight processors in, in our computers. And, and we've got, you know, two terabytes of SSD in our laptop. So it's an enormous amount of power. But the advance stopped. It's not getting better. The processors are not getting better anymore. The memory is not getting remarkably denser anymore. We're transitioning away from disks and into solid state. That's good. But we have reached this plateau of hardware technology. But the momentum that we had of all this change, change driven by the hardware, is still going. We still think it ought to be changing. And the hardware is not changing, so we change everything else. <laughs> 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 we, we, we still expect to be climbing this exponential curve and we're not. And at some point we all kind of have to relax and realize that we're on a plateau now. We're on a technology plateau. We're going to be on this technology plateau for decades. Uh, and we better start treating it like a technology plateau. Yeah. We don't want to reinvent the things all the time. But at the same time, <laughs> the reinventing is a matter of the of the progress. So a good example of that is, is the language Swift. Why did Apple come up with a new language? Now, I understand they wanted to get rid of Objective-C, and there are good reasons to get rid of Objective-C, because that's an extremely old language, and it wasn't a very well-written language to begin with. But, but why a new language? Why couldn't they have used... Uh, some of the existing languages that are out there. There are plenty of very good languages, just as good as Swift, um, maybe even better than Swift. Why wouldn't they have just adopted one of those? Why did they have to make a new language? Now, you know, Apple, it's Apple. Apple has to do everything their own way. And of course, they like to lock people in to, into a technology. So I, I imagine that the decision to make Swift was far more political than it was technical. But from a technical point of view, you don't need a new language because there's plenty of good ones out there. Why did Google decide to make Go? There are plenty of very good system languages out there. Why make a new one like Go? Now, I, I think Go is a great language. I love Go and it, it's fast. It's gorgeous to, to work in. But why make the new one? There, there are plenty of existing languages that would serve that purpose. Why make a new one? Maybe their reasoning was political as well. Why did the guys at JetBrain make Kotlin? What was the point of making this new language based on Java? Uh, uh, again, why do this? You know, we, there are plenty of reasonable languages out there. Why another new language? So, 
So these um, these constant reinventions of old technologies um, have begun to really annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the market domination aspect is also in the equation. So. <laughs> it is. It is. But as programmers, we should realize that. Yeah, and and the the the, um, the seduction is oh it's a new language it's so cool it's so great and programmers will adopt the language without realizing that they are being politically manipulated they're being manipulated into a market that's what happened with Java that's what's happening now with Swift um, and it's important for programmers to understand that oh they're manipulating me aren't they. They want me to use this language so that they lock me in. They're trying to damage my ability to be versatile. And it's important to understand that. It's kind of awareness of the industry, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. As we are speaking about changes, I'm just really interested. What significant change have you observed during your whole career? What was the one of the most important? Changes in software technology, there are three uh, in the course of my career that I have seen that have been um, remarkable. Um, the first one was, uh, the first one I observed was in 1968. Uh, and that was Edsger Dijkstra coming out and saying that GoTo might not be such a good idea. Um, <laughs> prior to that, Go-to was the way we worked. I mean, programmers, literally, that, that was how we worked. If we had a loop, there was a go-to in that loop. If we had an if statement, there was a go-to in that if statement. We, we used jumps to go everywhere. <laughs> and, and along comes Dijkstra and says, you know, that might not be such a great idea. And he presented this really beautiful reasoning for why it might not be such a great idea. And the entire software world erupted into a fury of yelling and screaming. Now, we did not have an internet in those days, so you couldn't flame anybody on Facebook. But you could write letters to the editors of the software journals. And boy, oh boy, those letters were pretty nasty. And then after five years, that all settled out. And we all realized, yeah, GoTo is probably not such a good idea. And you know, nowadays, we don't do an awful lot of GoTo. It is, it is difficult from our perspective today to look back on that event and see it as significant, but it was wildly significant. And it had a profound effect on all languages going, going for, f into the future from there, right? So to the point now that languages like Java and C Sharp and uh, Ruby and so on just don't have a go-to statement. They, they, they reserve the keywords so that you don't implement it. The second change, and it, it was actually, it actually predated uh, Dijkstra, but it was the second change that I saw. And that was the shift from uh, procedural programming to object programming. And that was actually invented in 1966 by two guys in uh, Norway, Ole Ahandal and Christian Nygaard. And it had a, a tremendous effect, a, a deeply profound effect on the whole industry. The whole industry in roughly around 1988 just started to go crazy over this idea of objects. Objects were everything. We had to have object-oriented languages. And Strustrup had made uh, C++ by this time. And, and uh, Smalltalk was around. And Objective-C had already been created in 1980. And everybody was yammering about objects. And that, that lasted uh, 20, 30 years Everybody was spinning about objects. Objects are great. Now, the real change there was not the, the notion of objects. Everybody you know, thinks about objects, oh, encapsulation, inheritance, blah, blah, blah. But the real change, the, the profound change, was the ability of these languages to allow us to make dynamically polymorphic calls. We can call a function without knowing what function we're calling. And that means that there's a, a, a reversal in the source code dependencies between modules. I, I can, from my module, call another module that my module has no source code dependency on. 
because the module that I'm calling derives from an interface that I am using. And, and that gives architects an immense amount of power because all of a sudden source code dependencies do not have to follow the flow of control. Do not have to follow the direction of your calls. They can be turned around against the direction of your calls. And that allows you to build very robust architectures. I don't want to go into all the reasoning behind that, but it's an enormously powerful mechanism that object-oriented languages gave us, although most people aren't really aware of it. The third remarkable change to software was the very first one to ever to ever be created. And that one was the, the idea of functional programming, which goes all the way the heck back to 1936. Uh, but the idea of functional programming is that you program without assignment statements. You never change the state of a variable. You may initialize a variable, but you may not then change it after that. Uh, and, and those three things, structured programming, object programming, and functional programming, are the biggest changes that have been made to the software industry since its birth over the last 70 years. They all occurred in the years between 1957 and 1968. It was a 10-year period and a very productive 10-year period where all three of these ideas emerged. And then there's been roughly nothing since. Is it the, a new big thing on the horizon or we're just done with our great ideas? There hasn't been a new big thing for 30 or 40 years. And there's no big thing coming that I can see. Oh, people will talk about machine learning. Oh, machine learning, that's the next big thing. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, it's an old idea. It's been around for a long time. And it's not It's not going to change the world. Sorry, everybody. Yes, I know. It, it does affect the Facebook algorithms and the YouTube algorithms. But, but no, it's not going to be, you know, <laughs> we're not going to have intelligent devices. We are not looking at at the singularity, that's not happening. Um, you know, we're not going to have an, you know, a, a, a machine that has roughly human sentient, sentience anytime soon. That's not happening. Um, uh, some people will talk about quantum computing. Oh, quantum computing, quantum computing. No, no, that's not happening either. We might get some very interesting uh, little machines that can solve very narrow problems but uh, quantum computers are not general purpose at all. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't envision big things on the horizon. I think the last sort of big thing was agile. And that was not even a technology. That was just a way to deal with people. And having, having seen that pass now for the last 20 years, I don't expect any massive new big thing. It's the question people always ask, what's the next big thing? And the most disappointing answer is, there isn't going to be one. But I think that is the answer. <laughs> I'm laughing right <laughs> now because this is our next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect, perfect. Because we, we would like to ask you if we about the future of IT and the future of programming in general. Because right now, it's at least in Poland, there's a huge hype about uh, GPT-3, OpenAI, all the stuff which can create a content, which create something which was created by, by, by human. Should we afraid this kind of approach? Generally speaking, is it the future of development? Or we still, <laughs> there will be a space for us as a developers? Uh, no, you shouldn't be afraid of this at all. Um, we might eventually make some Uh, rudimentary systems that can write a little bit of source code, but they would be writing source code from a formal language that would have to be specified by a programmer. Remember what it is that programmers are. You know, we, we programmers are detail managers. We are the ones who deal with all the details. We have to identify the details. We have to sort the details and organize the details and then write the code that addresses all those details. And there is no expert system in the world. There is no artificial intelligence in the world that has the, the human capacity to understand the impact of all these details. <laughs> It just doesn't exist. So no, uh, the, the grand dream, of course, is that 
a, a, a CTO or a, or a CEO of a company would sit down with an expert system and after an hour or two of dictating requirements, the expert system would magically come up with a vast Java program that would solve everything. No, that's not happening. <laughs> not even close. Yes, so, so there is there is need to be someone who understands business and understands IT still. Even, even, even though you say that they would not write code, they would still be writing formal documents that might as well be code. <laughs> It might as well be code. If you if you are writing a formal document that addresses every detail, you are writing code. Now maybe it doesn't look quite like the code you're used to, but it's still code. And it still requires the same thought process. We programmers have to deal with the details. And whether we use Fortran for that or Java for that or Lisp for that or Prolog for that, it's still a formal specification language. And it might as well be code. So if not writing the code will be our future main task, let, let's assume this way. So what kind of skills should we have in future? Let's say in the perspective of next 10, maybe 20 years. I know it's a huge amount of time, but what kind of skills should be useful for us in future? Well, the skills that will be useful for us in the future are the skills that are useful for us today. And it, it is the, the ability to conceive of a large, complex system. That's what a software system is, a large, complex system with lots of moving parts. The ability to understand and address all of the details involved with that large, complex system. The ability to specify that large, complex system in a formal manner that a machine can execute, which, which is a program. Uh, and then the ability to communicate ideas with other programmers, communicate those ideas with the business, the, the ability to understand the business and internalize it so that you can reflect it back into the program. These are all the same skills that we need today. There's no new skills that we're going to need to acquire in the next 20 or 30 years. There might be some interesting mathematics we should learn. And, you know, if we're going to be doing a lot of machine learning, there's some interesting mathematical algorithms there, but that's not unusual for programmers anyway. So I don't believe there's any new innate skill that we're going to have to learn over the next 20 or 30 years. Okay, so <laughs> I see, this <laughs> silence will be remarkable. <laughs> usually, usually I'm cutting off all the silence part. <laughs> this must, this, this, this must stay. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> okay, Bob. So I will have the last question for you. It's kind of out of the context, but if you had to remove one chapter from Clean Code, which would that be? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> We expected this kind of reaction, to be honest. So, <laughs> so th this is why we left this question at the uh, end. <laughs> if I had to remove, oh boy, boy, is that a dangerous question? Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, there was there was a chapter in there um, which was a refactoring of a module, uh, and I can't remember which module it was. I think maybe it was the fitness module, and. It's it's I, I did so much of that. I did so many of those refactorings of modules. You know, I thought that was that could be redundant. So if I had to pull a chapter out, it would probably be one of those example chapters because it was just a restatement of of older ideas. But I'm not going to take that out. So the the answer is none, right? <laughs> well, I mean. You were you were forcing me to choose one, so I 
I, 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 I gave you a candidate, but no, I'm not going to take that. It's valid answer for us. It's, it's great to know that you would not remove anything. So that's great. We are very, very happy you accepted our invitation to this podcast. Thank you very much. I need to confess something at this moment. Uh, I'm looking on my arms and I, I see a lot of a lot of goosebumps <laughs> right now. Uh, believe me, I've never expected that I will have this opportunity to chat with guy who wrote all the books I read during my computer study. So this is really, really the moment I will remember. And uh, I'm very thankful for this, uh, that we had this opportunity to spend together sometimes almost an hour. Uh, I don't know what about you, but I know I will remember this experience for a long time. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Sebastian, special thank you for you, for all the preparations, all the work behind the scene, all the emails you, and messages we sent together. And of course, Bob, uh, I would like to thank you for your perspective, for sharing your perspective, uh, thoughts about the history, about the current state and about the future of, of IT and IT industry. So I, I think the simple thank you is, is not enough here. So definitely, I really, really appreciate and thank you very much one more time. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, it's, it's a huge honor for me. Yeah, that, that, that was amazing, Ivan. Thank you for, for being here with us today. Certainly.